name is Yasser Ansari. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about bringing citizen science to the masses. But before we start, I just want to briefly tell you kind of what exactly citizen science is. It's pretty simple. It's basically opportunities for people who aren't trained professionally as scientists to still contribute to real scientific research, data collection, and analysis. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of no child left behind. I'm actually more interested in the concept of no child left inside. And I'm sure we're all deeply familiar with the concept of attention deficit disorder, especially today with all the different technologies that are competing for our attention. But I'm actually more interested in tackling nature deficit disorder. I really strongly believe that there's an educational need to get kids outside of the classroom and reconnected with nature. And there's an environmental need as well. We all know that ecosystems across the planet are in peril. We don't have to go too far away from our own country to, to realize what's happening. Um, and so this is not new. This is stuff that I've been inspired by the people before me, people like Richard Louv and his Children in Nature Network. I'm kind of following in the footsteps of people that have inspired me. And so how do I propose we tackle these issues? Well, this is how we're doing it. We're leveraging this explosion in citizen science, this rising surge of popularity, and we're, we're coupling it with the latest and greatest mobile and web technologies. So that's kind of where Project NOAA comes from. NOAA stands for Networked Organisms and Habitats, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. But before I go too much into depth on what NOAA is, I want to briefly talk to you about who I am, where I come from, and the perspective I'm bringing to, to tackling this challenge. Um, I studied molecular biology and bioinformatics as an undergrad at UC San Diego. I spent time in the genome analysis lab of the Salk Institute working on uh, E. coli and Arabidopsis, what I like to call Arabidabidopsis, the extra daba <laughs> makes it special. Um, and then in typical bio fashion, I left the lab and went into the telecom world. Um, so I worked at companies like Qualcomm, developing handheld radiation detectors, developing hardware for gaming, mobile hardware for gaming, um, cutting edge tech, uh, software and stuff like that. And then I just recently graduated from New York University's interactive telecommunications program. Basically what you were talking about earlier about the combination of technology and art, that's really what that program is all about. So um, what's our mission? It's really simple. At a high level, we're trying to reconnect people with the planet. And we want people to learn about the wildlife that's around them. And so through doing this, we're hoping to kind of boost our ecological intelligence, boost our eco IQs, um, you know, boost our eco literacy, our knowledge and awareness of what's around us. And so we have this really audacious goal. We, you know, we have this big, hairy, audacious goal, and that's really to become the common mobile platform for documenting all the world's organisms. And so in that spirit, we're really trying to, to measure Mother Nature's pulse. So as our network, which I'll describe uh, shortly, uh, grows, we're getting real-time information of encounters with nature, whether it's uh, a distressed bird in the Gulf Coast, or an invasive species in the middle of the country, or a funny-looking bird in someone's backyard. We're getting all this information in real time. And as we start to gather this, and as our network grows, we're really starting to measure the pulse of Mother Nature. And so that was a lot to kind of digest. So I just wanted to pause for a second to recap what, what Project NOAA is all about. It's really about citizen science, leveraging the explosion and in the, in the excitement around citizen science. It's about nature exploration, documentation, and discussion. And it's all built on top of a mobile platform that we've designed from the ground up uh, from scratch. So let me show you how it works. We just launched an application called Project NOAA. Tomorrow is the four-month anniversary of our iPhone application. Uh, when you launch the application, you go straight into a spotting mode, as seen here. You can tap on different categories to kind of assign them. You can fill out the, the form with descriptive information, attach a photo, and you submit it. That's really all you have to do. And you don't even have to know what it is that you're looking at. Our community can help you identify it as well. And one thing to note as well is that our technology works outside of network connection. Although it's based on mobile devices right now, let's say if you're out in the woods, you don't have a strong signal, We'll queue all the content for you, and then when you get back to, to the mothership or wherever your headquarters are, you can, uh, you know, we'll batch upload, one, uh, batch upload all those spottings once you come back. So the next mode of the application is this location-based field guide. Based on your location, we'll show you all the wildlife that's been spotted around you, and you can look at this information in two modes. On the left, we have a list view, so you can just scroll down. Uh, and on the right, we have a traditional map view. You can explore the map and see what's been seen around you. If you click on any one of the spottings, you'll see all the detailed information associated with those spottings. And if those spottings have been positively identified by our community, we'll provide you with a link to Wikipedia or the Encyclopedia of Life. 
So what's great about that is you can actually learn about the wildlife that's around you when you're actually in physical proximity to it. And to, to me especially, I think that's really exciting. And the third mode of, uh, of, the, of the application is what we call the field missions mode. And this is really where the citizen science aspects come out. Uh, so we've partnered with a bunch of organizations, research groups, universities to feature their citizen science projects. So based on your location, you can participate in a variety of things. You can read about them, you can learn about them, and actually submit content uh, towards them as well. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of those, uh, some of those field missions that we're working uh, with people on. Now, one of them is Project Squirrel. So that's out of the University of Illinois in Chicago. And basically, uh, Steve Sullivan is trying to track gray squirrel populations in North America. Another example is the Lost Ladybug Project out of Cornell. They're doing amazing work tracking ladybug diversity across the country as well. Another mission is the Mushroom Mapping Project that is in conjunction with the uh, Columbia University's Urban Landscape Lab and a New York organization called Stratospore. So now what you can do is if you're in your backyard and you see a ladybug or a mushroom, you can capture that moment, you can share that, and now you're contributing a data point to Cornell or Columbia's uh, ongoing research, which is really exciting. And another area that we're really actively involved with, which, which doesn't fall in the traditional category of citizen science, is more of this human-powered nature sensor network. And I'll explain that, what that means here in a second. Um, recently, we launched a field mission to help document the, um, the tragedy in the Gulf Coast, and we call it the Gulf Coast Oil Spill Mission. And basically, what we're asking people to do in the region is to document distressed wildlife, whether it's a plant or an animal. And so what we're, the, kind of the, the strategy behind this, or the long-term vision, is that as our network grows and as we have people on the front lines, whether they're in the Gulf Coast region or in some area in South America that's experiencing rainforest deforestation or uh, coastal um, garbage on the, on the west coast of California, our users will be out there documenting that as it happens. So they become the front line kind of sensor network, human powered for documenting the plight of the planet. And so when we launched that Gulf Coast um, oil uh, spill mission, you know, we, we tweeted about it. We got a tremendous amount of um, excitement on the web, a lot of retweets. We got a lot of press. And I got to thank Andy Carvin from, uh, from NPR and Crisis Commons because it was, it was with their encouragement that we, we set forth on this, on this goal. And so, you know, other field missions that we present as well, they're not all in the citizen science category. They're not all about you know, documenting distressed wildlife. It's also sometimes for fun and encouragement. During Earth Week, we put together an Earth Week 2010 field mission, and we got a, a slew of hundreds of spottings from across the country from, from different people, what, you know, plants, animals, uh, bugs, insects, and that sort of thing. And so what do we do when we get all this information? Well, we provide it to you on our website, networkedorganisms.com, and you can search through all the content um, that's available through categories as well. And uh, you know, when you arrive at the website, we just show you a random sampling from our database. You can learn more about it, or you can explore. And I've kind of circled or highlighted the new spotting mode up there as well. So you can actually submit content from our website as well. You don't have to have an iPhone or even a, a mobile phone for that matter. Here's another example. I've kind of stripped out some of the web stuff just to show you kind of a live snapshot of Central Park in New York City. Um, believe it or not, most of those data points are actually wild mushrooms. The mushroom mapping project is one of our most popular uh, projects. And we actually have the guy who wrote a North American field guide to wild, uh, wild mushrooms. He's our number one contributor. He's submitted over 205 wild mushroom spottings from in and around uh, Central Park, which is pretty mind blowing. Um, and this is just a snapshot of our species database. So the whole NOAA name, Noah's Ark, we used to call this internally the Ark. Um, and so this is, you can show you kind of the diversity. So we have everything from you know, plants down here. Uh, we got some ladybugs for ladybug projects, some birds. Even on top left, we have a cat. We found out a lot of people like to share photos of their pets. So we had to create a whole, <laughs> a whole pet, pet category filled with chihuahuas and like iguanas and stuff like that. So you know, we're not going to stop people from sharing it to us. It's, it's, it's wildlife, well, in a sort of sense. Uh, <laughs> native wildlife. And so all this information kind of is collected and it's easily visually searchable and, and that's really what we're trying to do. And then we've kind of had this foundation that we're building out called Mino and this is really the glue of the community where we're kind of encouraging people to kind of keep track of their submissions, talk to other people, help ident get identi uh, species identified. And this is just a, a glimpse of where it as is today. It's, as I said, very simplistic. You can see kind of some of the spottings I've submitted. You can see the top spotters around you. You can manage your Twitter preferences and things like that. Um, but there's a lot more we want to do with this. And this is basically how my NOAA looks like right now on the, on, the mobile, on the mobile device. And so just to give you kind of a glimpse of what we're doing, you know, kind of where we want to take this, 
Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with applications like uh, location-based services like Foursquare or Gowalla. Basically, they give you rewards and badges and stamps for doing particular things. And so we've kind of entered in this era that I call, you know, it's defined by this battle of the badges. You know, there's all these different services giving you badges to do different things. And, you know, some of them want you, you know, if you, if you get drunk on a school night, you get the drunk badge. Or if you, you know, if you go eat like 50 slices of pizza, you get the pizza badge and things like that. And so they're all, as we know, inspired by the Boy Scouts merit badge you know, merit badge system. So I'm here today to tell you that we're bringing badges back to nature and we have a bunch of cool concepts. These actually aren't ours. These are just some existing Boy Scout badges that we're working on to reward people for participating and documenting nature, documenting wildlife, going to zoos, going to botanical gardens and things like that. Um, and so that's kind of a glimpse of kind of where we're taking things and how we're planning on growing the, the communal aspects of NOAA. But I want to really t quickly talk to you about where Project NOAA is today. So since launching uh, basically four months ago, We've got over 8,000 downloads of the application, uh, over 2,500 spottings in over 42 countries. Nothing too mind-blowing, but significant, based that we've only been around for four months, and it's all through word of mouth. Uh, and that's just kind of a sampling of our most recent 1,000 spottings. Obviously, North America, uh, which we're, where we're based, has the most. But we had an article written about us in Spain, so we've been getting a really uh, great amount of uh, content submitted from Spain as well. So the whole language difference comes into play now as well some spottings in Spanish versus English. Uh, and then just a quick snapshot of the community and where we're at. Um, we have a wide variety of users. We have amateurs, we have experts. I mentioned Gary Linkoff, the, the mushroom expert. Uh, one of our first uh, teachers to use the, the, the application was in San Diego, they, uh, a sixth grade teacher. They had sixth grade camp. She took them out on a hike. They documented over 30 spottings uh, on the hike and they went back afterwards and relived their whole hike and talked about the wildlife that they saw along the way. And we're actually working with schools and other programs to kind of build out the curriculum. But we're not trying to dictate how it's used. We want to kind of work with teachers and educators to see how they feel they can use this platform as well. So some of the other organizations we're working with, we're working with the Natural History Museum on their Urban Biodiversity Network. It's basically a system of after school programs and schools uh, for kids to kind of get involved with like location-based nature uh, uh, focused activities. And um, we're working very closely with the Encyclopedia of Life. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's basically like a, a mission to create like a Wikipedia for wildlife. They want to create a, a Wikipedia style page for every living organism on the planet. And then after that, for even extinct species as well. And being in DC, we, uh, for the first time publicly, I, I want to announce that we're very close to uh, finalizing an exciting relationship with National Geographic that we'll be talking about more in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. For me, this is super exciting because you know National Geographic's been around for 120 years, founded the idea of connecting people to the natural world, and 120 years later, we're basically trying to do the same thing, but with the modern, modern tool set of mobile devices and the web. And so all this hard work is kind of paying off. We started development on everything you see here today six months ago with zero dollars and just a lot of sleepless nights. We're still not officially funded, but we've been getting a lot of press and we keep pushing. Uh, our work in the Gulf Coast was featured in US News. We've been on Gizmodo, which is a pretty uh, heavily trafficked tech blog a while, uh, a few times. Uh, we were on the front page of the iTunes App Store uh, during Earth Week as well. Like I mentioned, El País in Spain, a couple of newspapers internationally as well, in France and in Brazil as well. And then uh, South by Southwest, we got some, some action as well. And just last week, I, I, I was in Los Angeles, and I received a check for $50,000, our first inflow of money <laughs> ever uh, for, uh, thanks, for, uh, for a breakthrough in mobile learning. So that photograph is me holding a $50,000 check, a fake one. Uh, on the left is Anish Chopra, also known as the Indian George Clooney, uh, according to John Stewart. He's the chief technology officer of the United States of America. And on the right is Gary Nell. He's the president and CEO of the Sesame Workshop, or it used to be called the Children's Television Workshop, so you know, Sesame Street, all that stuff. They're doing a lot of great work in, in mobile learning tools. So we're super excited about that. And so what does the future hold? Well, the far out future, we have a lot of crazy uh, big ideas that we're kind of prototyping and hacking on internally. Things based are on a collaborative species identification, if you're familiar with services like Aardvark or Amazon's Mechanical Turk or Google Image Labeler. We're working on ways of kind of collaborating and kind of harnessing the masses to identify quickly species as you kind of encounter them. Uh, we have augmented reality working with a, a service called Layer, so you can actually kind of visually see the wildlife that's been spotted around you. And we're really fascinated by Google goggles and things like that, you know, computer vision-based stuff. So we're, we have this kind of pipe dream, and we're inspired by the work of people like Sean White out of Columbia, or formerly out of Columbia. I think he works for Nokia now. Uh, and just basically, you know, nature goggles, being able to identify things based on um, using your mobile device. But 
you know, coming back to like to where we are today, the near future, we're really focused on growing the community. Really, 8,000 8, downloads is phenomenal. It's great. We're excited about it. But this starts getting excited when you have 800,000 or 8 million users across the planet. So that's really what we're focusing on today. And with that, kind of evolving it into a really powerful learning, learning platform, not only for kids, but for kids of all ages. We find ourselves in a really exciting, but also a challenging position. We're right smack between uh, experts and amateurs. I call the experts, I kind of signify them by Latin and the amateurs by Latin. Basically, you can tell the experts, they got the genus and species names down, they have super descriptive text, you know, and dis, you know, uh, text on kind of tags on what they're looking at. And then the amateurs, they'll be like, you know, big scary bug, description, habitat. This bug is bugging out. This is like, you know, <laughs> some more notes. Freaking me out, get out of my apartment, things like that. It's like. <laughs> So like people would classify that as like garbage or noise, but I'm actually more excited about those because those submissions, like people, those particular users, they've never done anything like this before. It's their first time actually documenting nature and sharing it. So when I get a, a, a little like, you know, submission that says weird ass bug, I'm like the most exci excited for that. And so our challenge really is kind of to that knowledge flow, getting the experts who have all this knowledge and this willingness and ability to share and funneling it to the people that don't have that knowledge but are interested in finding out more. And so, you know, by bringing, you know, citizen science or at least nature focused citizen science to the mobile masses, our goal is really to, to help people reconnect with the planet. At the end of the day, people care about what they know. And if they know more about the wildlife that's around them, they're going to be much more willing to preserve and protect it. And so with that, I just really want to quickly say thanks to a bunch of people that have helped us. Obviously, as you can tell, this is a massively collaborative project. Uh, the rest of my team, Martin, Peter, and Bruno, ITP, which is the grad program I just finished with, Nathan Fritas, in whose class, in, 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 we actually hatched this idea in his class, the Cooney Center and Sesame folks, Startle, which is an amazing organization in New York helping learning-centered uh, startups get off the ground, the folks at IDEO, Andy Carvin at NPR and Crisis Commons, the Ignite NYC crew, National Geographic, the Natural History Museum, Encyclopedia of Life, and obviously the Pop, Pop Tech crew for bringing me out here. This has been an amazing, uh, amazing evening, and to curious naturalists everywhere, you and me. So thanks a lot. Check us out on the website if you're interested in what we're doing. If you want to learn more about it, talk to us, collaborate, drop me an email. Thanks. <laughs>